Hi, I'm Pedro da Costa, Director of Communications at the Economic Policy Institute, and this is the State of Working America podcast, where we seek to elevate workers' voices to make sure that they're heard in the economic policy debate in Washington and beyond. It's my pleasure and honor today to be joined by Chris Liu. Chris is President Obama's former Deputy Labor Secretary, and he's currently a fellow at the Miller Center at the University of Virginia. Thank you so much for joining me, Chris. Pedro, it's fun. Thank you for having me. So I'm really excited to have this conversation. It's, it couldn't be more timely. Uh, I feel like workers' issues are foremost in both the political and economic debates. Uh, the, the debate is shifting, and I really want to take a big picture look with you at how the economy has changed over time. Uh, so if you could talk a little bit about the story that has underpinned the economy, both in this recovery but also longer term, about workers losing out, losing ground in the economy, the sort of the story that the American dream has been dissipating for many American families and that the economy might not be working for everyone. Uh, what happened to the US economy over you know, recent decades that has changed the game and made, made Americans more pessimistic about their future, really? Well, Pedro, I'm glad you mentioned the American dream because I think about my parents. I'm a, a, the child of immigrants. My parents came to this country in the 1950s because there was this concept of an American dream. If you came to this country, you got an education, you worked hard, you could afford, you get, get a good paying job that would allow you to afford a home, uh, save for your kid's education, and retire. And unfortunately, in this country right now, that American dream is elusive for far too many people. And it's mirrored in the changes that we've had in our economy. I mean, there was a period of time in the post-World War II era when you could graduate from high school with just a high school education, get a good paying union job uh, that would allow you that American dream. And you had in the back of your mind an understanding that your kids would continue to have a better life than you had. Your grandkids would even surpass them. For a lot of reasons, which we should explore, that American dream just doesn't exist. I mean, in part, it's because of automation and technology and globalization, uh, external trends that have always happened. And, 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 you know, we can't really turn back the clock on those changes. In part, it's because of unionization and the decline of unionization and, and the decline of safety net protections for people in this country. But the flip of the story is that when I tell that story about what the post-World War II work uh, force was like, that was largely a workforce dominated by white men. And so the upside of all this is that we now have a uh, much more diverse workforce. The women are part of it. Uh, obviously, people of color are part of it. Uh, but we still have too many people that are being left behind. And when you have a period of time as we are in right now, where you have historically low unemployment, you know, we're below 4% in unemployment right now, Yet you have 40% of Americans who can't come up with $400 for an emergency expense. You've got uh, consumer debt, whether it's auto debt, student loan debt, that has now reached the pre-recession highs. Uh, you've got many people who really have jobs but are living on the edge. There's something wrong. And as you correctly point out, it's not just an economic discussion. It's a political discussion. And it's going to be one of the animating forces of the 2020 presidential election. Absolutely. I feel like it already is, right? Yeah. I mean, and uh, one of the things we focus on a lot at EPI is how to tell this story of an economy that's not really working for everyone at a time where the headline economic indicators appear to sort of all be falling in line. We have 2% growth overall. We have an unemployment rate that's held below 4% now for a year and a half. But of course, that doesn't tell the whole picture. And we tend to focus a lot on wage growth. But, you know, you mentioned a lot of factors affecting this sort of secular decline, if you will, of the American worker, but I'd like to break some of them down, yeah. especially the ones that we might have more control over that right. are more political. Could you start by talking about the the decline of unionization and how it, it played a role in, in raising inequality and kind of declining bargaining power for workers and so on? Because one of the one of the key issues it seems that in, in the Federal Reserve and other forces seem to finally be coming to this conclusion as you had this absence of wage growth in this recovery and everybody is asking why, why? And it's it seemed obvious to anybody who studies labor economics that it was a lack of worker purchasing power. Yeah. I mean look, you know this better than I do, but in in an in a workforce, uh, in a work environment, absent unions, there's unequal bargaining power. Uh, particularly when you're looking at workforces that it, are not skilled workers uh, by and large. Uh, unions provide a powerful leveling influence uh, in that 
combined ability of unions not only to bargain for better wages, but better benefits, better working conditions, lifts up everyone, and in the end creates for a more stable workforce. I would posit, although I'm sure folks in business would disagree, that unions are both good for workers and they're good for companies. Uh, but for a variety of reasons, including um, changes in the workforce, including obviously uh, political um, decisions, uh, laws that have made it much more difficult to unionize, uh, you know, that there has been a decline. And, you know, you can see that in terms of uh, rising income inequality, in terms of stagnant wages. Uh, you simply have to look at the experience of other countries, you know, Germany being a prime example, which is a, a country that is a heavily unionized country where there's far been far more consistent wage growth and far less inequality. And so I wanted to touch on that a little bit further. So Given the the role of unions declining, we've also seen renewed activism in other areas, even in some kind of non-union activities, including yeah. walkouts at places like Google and in the tech sector. Uh, what kind of mobilization do you see today that gives you hope that we might be seeing a reversal of that trend? Well, I, even in the union movement, while the percentage of unionized employees has decreased, uh, in certain sectors, they remain incredibly powerful. I'm thinking about the teacher strikes that we've seen over the last couple of years, which have pushed, effectively pushed, for wage increases in red states. Uh, now, in part, it's not just the union striking, but there really is sort of a public outcry that um, the, the, the the tax cut policies of the Republican Party at the state level have really deprived students of a quality education. So uh, that that uproar by teachers has really been mirrored by a public uh, outcry as well, that something needs to change along the way. Uh, but I am also encouraged in general by the increased public consciousness of companies. And you, know, you see this playing out not only, as you mentioned, in the tech sector, but you see this playing out, for instance, in the area of climate change. You know, notwithstanding uh, President Trump's decision to pull out of uh, of the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, you have companies continuing to stay part of that. Uh, and they're part of that because their workers demand it, their customers are demanding it, but they also understand it's good for business and it's where the United States should be. So in many ways where the government is failing the, um, the workers right now, companies are starting to step up. You know, last week or two weeks ago, the Business Roundtable came out with a um, it's a group of 200 prominent businesses in the United States that came out with a statement where they refocused their mission, and, and they really tried to prioritize not only sustainability but workers. Now, we can have a broader yeah, – I see, you, I see you smiling. We can have a broader conversation about um, how real that is and what substance uh, is there, uh, but that's certainly meaningful, and I think it certainly reflects not only where their workers want them to be, but more, frankly where their shareholders want them to be as well. No, absolutely. I, I was smiling because I find it fascinating. We've, there's been this whole discussion about how genuine is that yeah. statement? How much does it mean? I think the fact that it, I, I'm, I'm with you that the fact that the statement was made means a lot, whether it means that right. that they feel pressured to say something, it kind of doesn't really matter. The, the, the mere acknowledgement is, is substantial. Yeah. Right? I mean, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, ultimately it comes down to when there are actually policies that are being debated at the federal level where the business roundtable and their members ends up being. Now, they've always, or at least until uh, at least recently, they have supported an increase in the minimum wage, in part because most of those companies, frankly, could not hire workers, uh, could not attract the workers they need paying minimum wage. But it will be interesting to see when other um, more controversial legislation comes up, uh, whether there's any there there uh, to that statement. So given the recent tax cuts and the kind of American obsession with tax cuts as kind of the only way to do fiscal policy, right. how much do you think tax policy over time has contributed to, uh, again, the stagnation of, of workers' wages and inequality? Well, look, I think what we have learned painfully um, going back to the Reagan tax cuts is that a trickle-down economics does not work. Uh, it simply doesn't lead to the kinds of uh, gains in terms of higher wages, in terms of the hiring, certainly not in terms of business investment that the proponents have always uh, suggested it would be. And we kind of keep going through this. And then we go through it not only at the federal level, the state level, this idea that if we keep cutting taxes, it's going to uh, eventually help everybody. Um, you know, look, I'd love to say that the empirical facts will dissuade the, ne the next group of people from doing this, but I'm not convinced of that. Yeah. You know, we had a, a, a talk with Bob Kuttner, who's recently written a book yeah. called The Stakes, about how the next Democrat should run as a progressive. Uh, and I was wondering how you feel about, about the race in the following way. Uh, 
there's a school of thought that says that that Democrats, and I, I, I bring this up because you raised the issue of what the workforce used to look like, mostly white yeah. and male, and there was prosperity for them, and now it looks very differently and, and, and different, and the prosperity is not as equally shared. Uh, do you think that, you know, how does the Democratic Party play this in the sense of uh, A, trying to placate white working class voters in some way by not addressing the issue of race head on and making making uh, the policy issues more about the economy uh, and B, kind of taking the approach that is kind of uh, the, the, the sort of rainbow coalition approach and really tackling the right. issue of race head on and making that a central part of, of the campaign. You know, let, let me answer it this way. You have... Uh, the Trump administration trying to hearken back to a time, a golden era that, and frankly, didn't really exist for most Americans, uh, whether it's in terms of steel tariffs and manufacturing and try coal jobs, lots of things, frankly, that we can't go back to where we were. The question is whether it's the answer to, for replacing Trump uh, to, to embrace globalization and trade and a service economy. I don't know. If, uh, that may be the reality. That may be the economic reality. Uh, as a political reality, that's a pretty tough message to sell to a lot of people in this country, that uh, the type of job you've had and your parents have will never exist again. I think the broader problem in this country, and this is not a Democrat versus Republican issue or a red versus blue issue, it's really we what we have in this country right now is an urban versus rural issue right now. You know, I think back to last year when Amazon was trying to decide where to put their uh, HQ2. Um, you know, their, their 20 finalists were places like Philadelphia and Atlanta and Boston and Washington, D.C. and New York. And that's the problem. The jobs are basically now flowing to urban and suburban areas. And again, we, it's, you know, whether it's Chicago or whether it's Charlotte, it's, they're largely going to those areas. They're not going to places like Mississippi and West Virginia. And the old way that those states used to attract businesses there was through tax incentives. And I think a lot of companies have realized, you know what, it's not just about tax incentives. It's about uh, it's about having access to a good transportation. It's about a trained labor force. It's about the types of cultural amenities that our workers and particularly our executives want to have. And you see that stratification playing out, and it happens in every state. You could have a place like Virginia where northern Virginia is booming, but southwest Virginia is not. You see this happening between rural Texas and you know the conflict between that and Austin and Dallas and Houston. And no one has quite figured out how we bring jobs back to those forgotten places. The Trump answer, which is we go back to a manufacturing uh, economy that we had in the 1950s, isn't the answer. The answer certainly can't be we're going to train all those people for new jobs because the reality is you can train people for jobs where those jobs aren't going to be there. They're going to have to leave. What do we do about those forgotten places? And I don't know that any policymaker has the answer or I've heard has the answer to that. Do you think – what's your view on the on the manufacturing sector generally? Uh, you know, as a, as a reporter – the story that I also was always told by the sort of con consensus economics is that, you know, forget about manufacturing, it's gone and dusted. We should just focus on our competitive advantages, which is services. Uh, I have colleagues at EPI that, that kind of beg to differ, and I think <laughs> that e while small, uh, as, as in terms of the, the size of the role of the economy, manufacturing is important for its kind of its multiplier yeah. effects. Uh, do you think that, it, it, that manufacturing is something that you know is a sector that we kind of have given up on or and, and what's the role of automation you know within that because I'd like to expand on, on that a little bit look I'm, I'm a big believer in the future of American manufacturing and I don't think we should give up on it and when I was the deputy secretary of labor I spent a lot of time visiting factories both you know a, a major auto plant outside of Kansas City uh, to small uh, manufacturing facilities in North Carolina and so I've seen people who can do it and what but but you have to do it in a certain way. If you go to any factory now, it doesn't look like the factory of 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, first of all, there are very few people that work there. It's remarkably clean. Um, the machines aren't necessarily run by hand. They're run by computers. And so we can do advanced manufacturing in this country, and we could take advantage of um, – uh, the innovative uh, innovation advantage that we have over countries, um, the skilled workforce that we have, but it can't. We can't manufacture everything. I mean, it, there becomes a level point at which it is no longer uh, efficient 
uh, for us to do it. I, I always tell people, like, look, if you want to go to a Walmart and buy a $5 T-shirt, you can sure as hell bet that that's not going to be made in the United States because the labor costs are just too high. That being said, you see a lot of manufacturers moving back to the United States, both because they're concerned about a transportation costs or intellectual property considerations, um, and that they figured out an economical way to do it. But it's not easy. But I think I, I, it, we would be wrong to give up on it. And how big a threat do you actually feel that automation is to employment generally? Because sometimes I feel like it's overstated. We, we hear a lot about yeah. the roboticization of the workplace, but we don't actually see it taking over in, in any immediate ways. You know, I don't know how much of a threat it is, but I think it's, it's, you clearly can't wish it away. You know, we have gone through economic changes in our country's history, whether it's an industrial revolution or the computer revolution of the 70s or the internet revolution. Tech change happens. Technology is here to stay. Uh, and what that means is that you're going to be able to go to the auto plant that I went to. Uh, they're going to be able to make as many cars as they've made 20 years ago with half as many people. And it means that you're going to go to a McDonald's and you're going to see the food uh, and the order being taken uh, on a computer. Uh, you're going to punch it in instead of, instead of uh, telling it to a cashier. So jobs will be lost along the way. The challenge is that there will always be jobs for people uh, for, that cannot be automated. And what do you do for those people? You know, Andrew Yang would say we should give everyone $1,000 a month. Others would say maybe we simply need to raise the, the minimum wage to help give those people a living wage. The truth of the matter is, in, in some ways, some of the, 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 the fastest growing jobs in this country are nurses' aides and home health workers. And you're never going to be able to automate that away. And yet those jobs pay subsistence wages. And so if those are the jobs that can't go away, then we need to make sure that somebody can actually do those important jobs and still make a living and, 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 and raise a family on that. Absolutely. Uh, and that goes back to, of course, workers' rights and unions. And, and I wanted to ask you about, about Trump's promises and, and uh, promises kept and, and, <laughs> and, and not. So it's easy to forget that he ran on a sort of pro-worker platform, yeah. right? Because he's done so many, he's taken so many anti-worker policy measures over time. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how Trump's uh, role in, in sort of labor policy specifically, yeah. any, anything that keeps you up at night that worries you, any rollbacks? Because it seems like there's a lot happening under the hood or under the radar that really we don't have the room for that kind of wonky news in this news cycle. You know, I made the, the statement on another interview, um, another <coughs> media outlet recently, where I said that Trump is the most anti-labor president uh, that we've seen potentially, at least since we passed the Fair Labor Standards Act uh, in the 1930s. Somebody quibbled with me as to whether Reagan had been worse, and I said, well, okay, we can have that conversation, although, um, it, you know, uh, even President Reagan, uh, you know, uh, uh, the minimum wage was increased under his period of time. Um, you know, his labor secretary still did good things on behalf of workers. The truth is, I, I'm hard-pressed to find anything that this president has done that has helped workers. Um you know, it, it's not just a tax cut that's added over a trillion and a half dollars to the to the federal deficit, which makes it much more challenging to do anything else. Uh, it's the rollback of important policies that we did during the Obama administration, like the overtime rule, like the fiduciary rule. Uh, it's appointing conservative judges uh, that have consistently taken anti-worker positions. You know, the only thing in many ways that has saved this country is, I think, just their sheer incompetence, their inability to, to, to get some of these rules out the door. Um, but, you know, uh, if he gets four more years, um, he will do far more damage. And what is amazing to me is that, you, as you pointed out, he, he promised uh, to undo the American carnage and to think and, and to remember the forgotten Americans in this country. And, and what he has done is to advance a purely pro-employer, pro-corporate agenda. And, uh, you know, and, and even on the moves that he's tried to do, I mean, look, he, he's promised to bring back coal jobs, and yet he's, you know, uh, appointed uh, former coal mine executives to, 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 to oversee their safety, and he's undone the safety uh, protections for them. And so even when he takes a half step in the direction of workers, he takes like two or three steps backwards. Absolutely. No, it's been, it's been quite a barrage to keep up with. Uh, it's interesting that you brought up immigration because I feel that, you know, in your own experience, uh, because it's a because it's similar to my own and to so many Americans, but also because it to me, it speaks to how 
rather than kind of reviving the American dream or even believing in it, Donald Trump is kind of putting it, seems to be putting a nail in its coffin. Yeah. Or, because, you know, other than the idea, you know, apart from the idea that if you work hard, you can get ahead and everything else we discussed of the American dream, the other side of the American dream is you can come from somewhere else right. with nothing and get ahead. And right. your parents immigrated here for that reason. My parents came here from Brazil for that same reason. There was opportunity. They could, they could go to great schools <clears throat> primarily, and that's what, that's what they came here for. How do you see his immigration policy affecting the labor market in the long run? Because we know we need a, a growing population to sustain, you know, economic growth is in part based on population growth. We need young people to kind of maintain a healthy, vibrant society. How does his immigration outlook yeah. kind of complement the, 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 you know, how does the white nationalist part of the yeah. agenda complement the, the corporatist part? You know, the irony is that he will make the argument that his immigration policies are important to sustaining the economy. And you know, your good folks at EPI and other economists will tell you that immigration is vital to the growth of a company. And so, you know, what he's basically saying is look, we should create standards that we should only take, you know, high skilled immigrants to this country from certain types of countries. And he doesn't overtly say it, although it's pretty obvious uh, that there's a racial element to that. The truth of the matter is. You know, many of our families have come here without a huge amount of skill, without a huge amount of education, and have done wonderful things. And that is the American story. If you're coming here and you're willing to work hard, you can get ahead. Uh, but even leaving aside, you know, whether we should prioritize uh, skilled versus unskilled, the truth of the matter is the U.S. economy cannot function without a supply of unskilled labor to this country, whether it is people that are picking fruit or vegetables and farms or um, seasonal seafood workers on the Maryland Eastern Shore, uh, or even Donald Trump's own properties like Mar-a-Lago depend on a supply of guest workers, uh, which needs to happen in this country. Um, and then you look more broadly at this and you look at different places around the country. The immigration story is not quite what Donald Trump has suggested. You know, one of the most meaningful trips I took when I was the Deputy Secretary of Labor is I went to Dayton, Ohio, which has obviously been in the news uh, recently because of unfortunate incidents. And I spent time with the mayor there, Mayor Nan Whaley, who had a uh, spearheaded a welcome, uh, basically a welcome home, a welcome to America initiative to bring immigrants and refugees to Dayton. And in part because of that initiative, uh, she's been able to stem the decrease in population in Dayton uh, through bringing uh, immigrants, refugees in who have both brought skills, um, who have helped reinvigorate the downtown, have brought a whole new interesting set of uh, cultural uh, 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 um, cultural uh, amenities, uh, restaurants, uh, and you see this playing out. You know, again, it, you know, the, the, you look in places like Iowa, uh, in Arkansas, and you, whether it's meatpacking plants or whatever it is, um, these small towns understand they can't exist without immigrant workers. Now, look, we should obviously ensure that people are coming here. They're coming here legally. That we figure out a, a path for citizenship for the people that are here. But this country has always been about opening our arms to people from other countries, not only because it was a right thing to do, but it was a smart thing to do. So I wanted to shift the discussion a little bit. Thank you so much for that, because that's really, that's really helpful and insightful. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about the current state of the economy, uh, because you know people seem to be, it's actually a curious state of affairs for somebody who was a reporter during the last financial crisis. Yeah. Last time around, everybody was asleep at the wheel. We all thought, you know, we all, everybody was saying growth was still strong when we were already in a deep recession. This time we're sort of recession sensitive. Yeah. So we're kind of, we're always, we're always seeing it around the corner and we've been seeing it around the corner for a long time. And so it's interesting that we're in a moment where growth is, you know, weakening, but not exactly faltering. And yet we're talking about recession. So I have two separate questions um, for you. One is how do you look at the current state of affairs and how do you assess the current economy? But also, uh, looking at a potential next recession, whenever it might arise, how well prepared do you think we are, not just economically, but also politically in terms of having learned the lessons yeah. from, from the last one? I, I am, 
I, I am on the fence as to whether we're heading into a recession, but we are, the economy certainly is slowing down right now. And whether it's uh, consumer confidence numbers that came out recently that showed uh, the biggest decline in um, six years or manufacturing slowdown, the biggest drop in three years, uh, the jobs market clearly is slowing down at this point. And so you see a lot of indicator suggesting a slowdown and obviously the president's trade war is creating headwinds that are that are creating a lot of uncertainty for businesses right now the challenge and as we mentioned at the outside is that you've got a lot of americans notwithstanding the fact that they have jobs are really kind of just living paycheck to paycheck and so it really would not take much uh increase in the unemployment rate to throw a lot of people over the edge right now and and that's troubling uh, and then you look at, frankly, the macroeconomic tools that we have at our disposal to fight it. Uh, we're, we're, we're now heading, uh, the annual deficits now will approach $1 trillion uh, really for the, for the foreseeable future under this president and potentially the next president. Uh, you've got interest rates which are really low. So a lot of the tools and levers we traditionally had at our disposal uh, to get ourselves out of a recession um, may not be available the next time around. What do you make of one last question, which is a little bit more specific, but kind of frightens me a little bit because it's uh, it was one of the key uh, buffers in the last recession, uh, and that's state unemployment benefits. Yeah. Uh, it seems like that's really the first line of defense when we have a recession and, and there's an uptick in joblessness. Uh, but a lot of the state benefits, as far as I understand it, have been curbed over time and have been diluted, and there yeah. were caps put on it. How concerned are you that we have, you know, I, you know, whether or not we have the fiscal room, whether we even have the fiscal policy infrastructure to deliver the stimulus in the right ways? Look, I mean, this is sort of a broader problem in our country right now. During this last, you know, nine years of economic expansion, it would have been the smart thing uh, for a lot of states not only to build up surpluses in their budgets, uh, potentially shore up their unemployment systems, which, as you suggest uh, correctly, um, there have been a, it, it, the eligibility standards. Um, have complicated people's ability to get unemployment. The benefits really aren't what they ought to be. And so it is a safety net, uh, but it's a pretty tenuous safety net right now. And they certainly, many states certainly are not ready for the deluge of, uh, you know, of people that might come their way if we have a recession. I don't think we're going to be in the 10% unemployment range that we were in 2010. Uh, but as I said, there's so many people that are on the edge right now um, that you could sort of see this as a house of cards coming down pretty fast. Chris Liu, thank you so much for taking the time. Chris is a fellow at the Miller Center at the University of Virginia, and he's also the former Deputy Labor Secretary under President Barack Obama. Thank you so much for your time. I really My appreciate pleasure. it. My pleasure. Thank you.